It's, it's hard to, to wrap your head around the fact that we need to completely transform everything. It's a convenient illusion that reform will change things. My name is Adriana Lauren. I use she, her pronouns, and I identify as bisexual. So the way I see it, climate justice is racial justice, and we cannot separate these two issues. I don't think we can address climate change without addressing racial justice. Marginalized communities all over the world, especially BIPOC communities and communities in the global south, are disproportionately impacted by climate change. This comes, for example, with rising sea level, this comes with increases in hurricanes, with droughts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is something that I've also felt personally in, in my own community in Honduras. Climate change is so deeply linked to resource extraction, which is deeply linked to colonialism and to capitalism. Marginalized communities like indigenous communities, black communities are also being impacted really intensely by these extractive projects. The only way that we'll be able to address the, the issue of climate change is if we take a profound intersectional lens in addressing it and if we truly believe and understand the lived experience of BIPOC communities, centering their leadership and uh, their voices. I think that's how we would be able to address the, the current climate crisis that we have been in for a very long time. When I first started being involved in these conversations, a lot of the conversations were focused on individual action. Recycling and like turning off the lights, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think we can individual action our way to systemic change. Like we need individual people to join a collective action movement for systemic change. These are issues that are embedded in our institutions when we're talking about racial justice as well. We can't think about uh, racial justice as an individual action thing. We've seen time and time again on Canadian soil as well, how the police and the RCMP are actually used against the folks who are defending their land and defending their water from extractive projects on unceded territory. Understanding how these institutions are grounded, like literally rooted in oppression and racism is really important to understand why reform isn't the way to go. Who is surprised? Who is actually surprised to see that there's still racism in Canada? Who has been asleep for so long that they weren't even aware that these issues are still so persistent in everyday life in Canada? The way Canada always presented itself, kind of an international perspective, um, is as better than the US. That's a very low standard, first of all. Uh, this, this PR stunt they have is also so inaccurate. Once you really start to learn about not just Canadian history, but also what is currently happening in Canada, there's still so, so many indigenous communities in Canada that don't have access to, um, to safe drinking water. This is something that's been going on for years as well. This is not something new in, in Shelburne, uh, Nova Scotia. There was a dump right next to their community that was leaching toxic waste, that was leaching all kinds of pollutants. This is a predominantly black community. There's a lot of folks who have died from cancer, actually. They've still found arsenic in water in these communities, which is absolutely unacceptable. I think another issue that is connected to both race and climate is uh, what's happening on Wet'suwet'en and how the RCMP were, were sent to forcibly remove land and water defenders that were fighting against the, the pipeline that was unwanted, um, that they did not give consent to um, on their unceded lands. Hogan's Alley in Vancouver, a historically black community, um, was displaced to create uh, a viaduct. There's something to be said on the connection between urban planning and climate change. Planning for cities is gonna be one of the most challenging things when it comes to climate change adaptation. And to me, that kind of begs the question on like, who is planning our cities? Who is planning our future? Who currently has the power and the agency to shape our collective future? It can sometimes be difficult to imagine what a just world looks like, or not even to imagine, but to remember what a just world looks like in the past. So my vision for a world where climate justice and racial justice are respected, I think we need to take an intersectional lens and to really have the people who are impacted by decisions making decisions. So centering the lived experience of BIPOC youth, of migrants, of queer folks, of folks living with a disability. There's so, so many different folks that we, we don't hear from. And I think we need their perspectives um, to shape this just and uh, sustainable, resilient world. Some of the things that I'm imagining, for example, making sure that folks have access to safe drinking water, making sure that folks are actually able to put food on their plates that's culturally relevant to them, um, that folks have access to their land, that folks are able 
able to make it through the day without having to, to struggle. Um, and I think no one individual can have that answer. I think we need to collectively come together and shape this world together. I think it needs to be grounded in justice, in relationships, in intersectional approaches, and in, in kindness and empathy.